When it comes to a patient suffering a medical emergency or a traumatic injury, healthcare providers at all levels have been taught to assure that the patient has a, sufficient, a good airway, sufficient breathing, and adequate circulation. One of the tools providers have in their toolbox is a nasopharyngeal airway. However, it isn't without controversial, long-held beliefs about this device that causes a problem. Stick around as we take a quick dive into the nasopharyngeal airway. A nasopharyngeal airway is a hollow, flexible tube that healthcare providers can insert into a patient's nair to assist with either oxygenation or ventilation. The device is used in pediatrics, adults, and geriatrics alike. It is considered a basic airway device that can be used in patients who you suspect have a gag reflex and are in need of airway management either for a short time or until a more advanced airway is inserted. Now, these indications are currently what the literature really does agree on. There is essentially some things that the literature really doesn't agree on, and that's what we're going to take a look at. This biggest discrepancy that we look at is in relationship to utilizing the nasopharyngeal airway in the event that an individual has what is to believe to be a basal or skull fracture. Now, the emergency medical journal had written an article in which it was disproving some myths related to the nasopharyngeal airway. PHTLS 9th edition textbook also brought up straight facts that are quite difficult to disprove. The first is, outside of obtaining a CT scan, the diagnosis of a basal or skull fracture can only then be presumed if the clinical signs of a basal or skull fracture are present. Now, when taught about a basal or skull fracture, the classic presentation that is taught is that of someone suffering raccoon's eyes, which is that ecchymosis around their eyes, or the presence of battle signs, which is bruising over the mastoid process. However, these are not immediate findings, and in fact, they take up to about 24 hours to present. Additionally, this bruising is found in many trauma patients and is associated with more soft tissue injuries then that leads to assessing for blood or cerebral spinal fluid in the nose and ears. Well, if you're talking about blood in their nose, there is no sense in testing for the cerebral spinal fluid that may be in there. One of the reasons for that is because it is not very specific in relationship to determining whether or not cerebral spinal fluid is present. When you are taking a look at what your other alternative is, a patient that has suffered a seizure, stroke, or even traumatic brain injury may have a clenched jaw. As a result, we're not going to be able to insert an oropharyngeal airway into these folks. Likewise, our other problem may be that if there is some blood that is coming from the nose and we're very well concerned about a basal or skull fracture, as was only reported in two case studies in history, that we may now actually find that the patient has a gag reflex. This in turn means that we take a intact or trying to secure a good airway and we now compromise it with vomitus. Additionally, once we make the patient gag, they now increase their intracranial pressure. So some things that we can make sure that we're going to do. First off, we're gonna make sure that we measure a nasopharyngeal airway properly. Nasopharyngeal airway is to be measured from the tragus of the ear to the tip of the nose. Now, the diameter is something that we really don't always have to take a look at. It's more about the length of the nasopharyngeal airway than anything. Matter of fact, there have been reports the nasopharyngeal airway may not be long enough to bypass the tongue or not even pass through the soft palate itself. By the way, after insertion, this does require the assessment of breath sounds and ALS providers should assure good waveform capnography. When inserting, we wanna make sure that we're placing the bevel of the nasopharyngeal airway towards the nasal septum. Then we're assuring that the nasopharyngeal airway is on the floor of the nasal canal so it reduces the chance of moving more superiorly and into the cribriform plate. Once it is inserted the full way, the flange should come to rest at the nair opening. 
This is a, just a quick view of what it would look like if you were to take a laryngoscope and look inside the mouth to assess where the nasopharyngeal airway is. You can see where the uvula is, as well as the nasopharyngeal airway going through the soft palate beyond the uvula. And really, we're looking for this to stop about 10 millimeters superiorly to the epiglottis. So basically, we want it to stop 10 millimeters prior to the epiglottis, and this will help assure that we have excellent airway management. So if you were to take some things away from this, a nasopharyngeal airway is indicated for anyone who requires temporary airway control to improve oxygenation and ventilation. This does include individuals who are unconscious for any reason, and if you need to manually open their airway, you need to consider a nasopharyngeal airway. Number two, it should be the initial temporary airway of choice in any patient who has a pulse. This avoids attempting to see if a patient even has a gag reflex. Number three, if a patient has blood from the nose, caution should be taken in securing the airway. There is no contraindications to insertion. Number four, measuring from the tragus of the ear to the tip of the nose. Number five, making sure that you insert a lubricated nasopharyngeal airway into the nair with the bevel facing towards the septum. You can twist it to the right and to the left as you start to insert it, and it will aid in the ease of inserting the nasal airway. You want to stop insertion when the flange of the nasopharyngeal airway rests against the nostril. Number six is to assure that you have good airway movement and you assess breath sounds. And finally, number seven for ALS providers, making sure that you apply electronic waveform capnography typically before and after insertion. We hope that you found this information helpful. If you have any comments on this topic or have an idea for future topics, please leave a comment below and be sure to like or follow our social media pages. Take care.